Welcome to section three of cellular biology. In this section, we'll be discussing connective tissue. Connective tissue is an abundant supportive tissue throughout the body. It provides structure and support to organs and connects tissues together. There are three components of connective tissue that you should be familiar with for step one, and these include collagen, elastin, and fibrillin. Let's discuss collagen first. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body and can be found in bone, skin, cartilage, blood vessels, and many other organs and tissues. There are four types of collagen, types one through four. However, this is usually not emphasized on step one. It's much more important in high yield to focus on the disorders associated with collagen. These include scurvy, osteogenesis imperfecta, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and Manx disease. These can best be understood by looking at collagen synthesis. This is an overview figure of collagen synthesis, which can be found in section three of cellular biology. Collagen is synthesized by chondroblasts, osteoblasts, and fibroblasts. So as we go through the pathway, we'll assume we're looking at collagen synthesis from the perspective of one of these cells. Notice that collagen synthesis is a multi-step process that starts in the nucleus and doesn't end until after it has been released into the extracellular space. Also notice that several key steps are marked with numbers and these correspond to disorders seen in the bottom right side of the image right here. Okay, from the figure, you can see the collagen mRNA right here. It enters the rough endoplasmic reticulum and is translated into the pro-alpha chain, which is a precursor for collagen. You can see the pro-alpha chain right here. A pro-alpha chain consists of a repetitive amino acid sequence, which you can see right here. Glycine XY, glycine XY. This is showing that the amino acid glycine is found at every third amino acid position. The X and Y can be either proline or lysine. In other words, the amino acid with the highest concentration in collagen is glycine. Once in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the pro-alpha chain undergoes two more steps, hydroxylation and glycosylation. During hydroxylation, OH molecules are added to proline and lysine residues. You can see that right here. You should also know that vitamin C is a cofactor for these hydroxylation reactions, which means that patients who are deficient in vitamin C may have impaired collagen synthesis. This is also known as scurvy, so it requires vitamin C, and a defect can result in scurvy. Because fruits and vegetables contain vitamin C, people who are unable to consume an adequate quantity of fruits and vegetables can develop a vitamin C deficiency. As we just saw, this results in decreased hydroxylation of collagen, which ultimately means less collagen is synthesized, and also the collagen that is synthesized ends up being weaker, so these patients have decreased tensile connective tissue strength. As a result of the decreased collagen synthesis, these patients commonly present with swollen gums, poor wound healing, and bruising. These symptoms should hopefully all make sense to you intuitively based on the location and function of collagen. For example, collagen is an essential component of skin, blood vessels, and granulation tissue, so these tissues become weaker when collagen is deficient. After hydroxylation, the pro-alpha chain is glycosylated. You can see sugar molecules being added to the chain right here. Also notice that once this happens, the pro-alpha chain can combine with other chains, resulting in the formation of what's known as a triple helix. This is just a polymer of three pro-alpha chains which have undergone hydroxylation and glycosylation. The triple helix is also known as pro-collagen, which you can see right here. So step three is assembly of the pro-alpha chain into pro collagen. You should know that defects in the formation of the triple helix can result in osteogenesis imperfecta. Osteogenesis imperfecta is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder, most commonly caused by a genetic defect in the COL1A1 and COL1A2 genes. Genetic defects result in decreased formation of pro-collagen, which means that there will be less normal collagen in these individuals. These patients commonly present with multiple fractures during childhood and can be confused with abuse. They may also have blue sclerae. Collagen normally obscures the blue choroidal veins in the sclerae, and in osteogenesis imperfecta, collagen formation is disrupted, resulting in translucent connective tissue. This makes the choroidal veins become more prominent. They may also have hearing loss because the ossicles of the ear can be affected. Finally, they may have abnormal teeth due to the lack of dentin. Okay, let's review with a question. A 71-year-old male is brought to the emergency department by his daughter 
due to tender gums and petechiae over the lower extremities. She states that he has lived alone for the past two years after his wife passed away. Since that time, he has struggled with depression and finds little pleasure in eating. He states that he has mostly eaten meat, bread, and desserts. The physician on call suspects a nutrient deficiency resulting in impaired synthesis of an important molecule. What step in the synthesis of this molecule is most likely impaired? Hopefully from the question stem you notice that this patient has tender gums and petechiae over the lower extremities. He has also mostly eaten meat, bread, and desserts for the past two years. This description is consistent with scurvy or vitamin C deficiency. The question also states that the physician suspects a nutrient deficiency resulting in impaired synthesis of an important molecule. The molecule that's being referred to here is collagen. Okay, with this in mind, we're asked what step in the synthesis of this molecule is most likely impaired. If we look at the overview image, we can see that hydroxylation of the pro-alpha chain requires vitamin C. So in answer to the question, hydroxylation of the pro-alpha chain is most likely impaired. Okay, let's continue discussing collagen synthesis. Once pro-collagen is formed, it's moved to the Golgi apparatus and then secreted into the extracellular space, so exocytosis, which you can see right here. From here, the ends of the molecule are cleaved by C and N pro-collagen peptidase enzymes. When this occurs, the molecule is called tropocollagen. From here, the tropocollagen is cross-linked with other tropocollagen molecules by the enzyme lysyl oxidase. So this is represented by number six right here. This is the final step, which results in the formation of a mature collagen fiber. Notice that defects in either of these steps can result in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Also notice that because copper is an essential cofactor for lyocyl oxidase, impaired copper absorption can result in impaired activity of lyocyl oxidase. There is a disorder that results in impaired copper absorption, which is known as Menck's disease. As we just discussed, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is caused by deficiencies of procollagen peptidase or lyocyl oxidase. Ultimately, this results in decreased cross-linked collagen. The collagen then becomes weaker and more elastic, which explains many of the symptoms. There are two major types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that you need to be familiar with for step one. The classic type results in stretchy skin, easy bruising, and hypermobile joints. The vascular type can cause CNS aneurysms. Menck's disease is a genetic disorder that results in decreased copper absorption. Because copper is an essential cofactor for lyocyl oxidase, impaired copper absorption can result in impaired activity of lyocyl oxidase. Ultimately, this results in decreased cross-linked collagen. Symptoms include growth retardation, brittle hair, and hypotonia. Okay, let's do a question. A four-year-old boy is brought to the physician by his mother for a routine visit. While examining the patient, the physician notices that he is able to extend his index finger backwards, allowing him to touch the posterior aspect of his wrist. Upon further questioning, his mother states that he bruises easily. The physician suspects a genetic disorder resulting in impaired synthesis of an important molecule. What step in the synthesis of this molecule is most likely impaired? Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this boy has hypermobile joints, because he can extend his index finger backwards, allowing him to touch the posterior aspect of his wrist. He also bruises easily. These findings are consistent with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The important molecule being described is collagen. From the overview figure, we can see that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is caused by deficiencies of procollagen peptidase or lyocyl oxidase. So in answer to the question, either cleavage of procollagen terminals, so the N-terminal and the C-terminal, or formation of cross-links may be impaired in this individual. Okay, let's move on and discuss elastin. This is a figure of elastin synthesis, which can be found in section three of cellular biology. The details of elastin synthesis are not nearly as important as collagen synthesis. However, you should know that elastin is synthesized in a very similar way to collagen. One difference, is that elastin relies on a scaffold of microfibril molecules, which you can see right here. Fibrillin-1 is a component of the microfibrils, and defects in fibrillin-1 can result in a syndrome called Marfan syndrome, which we'll discuss in a minute. Notice that just like collagen synthesis, elastin synthesis relies on the enzyme lyocyl oxidase for cross-linking. In collagen synthesis, cross-linking results in the formation of a strong collagen fiber. In elastin synthesis, however, cross-linking gives elastin its elastic properties. In other words, it makes elastin stretchy. This property is 
particularly important in the lungs because it allows the lungs to expand during inspiration and recoil during expiration. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a disorder that's covered more in the videos on pulmonary physiology, but you should know that this disorder results in increased degradation of elastin and can ultimately cause emphysema. As I briefly mentioned a moment ago, Marfan syndrome is a genetic disorder that results in a defect in fibrillin 1. Because this is a component of the microfibril scaffold, it can impair elastin synthesis and can result in weak connective tissue. Fibrillin 1 is particularly abundant in the heart, the lens, and the periosteum. So defects in the protein primarily affect these tissues. From this, we could deduce some of the features, and these include aortic dissection, mitral valve prolapse, cataracts, individuals who are tall with long extremities, and a caved-in chest appearance, which is known as pectus excavatum. Okay, let's wrap up this video with one more question. A 24-year-old male with no significant past medical history presents for a routine office visit. He is six and a half feet tall and has long extremities. During cardiac auscultation of the left sternal border, a holosystolic murmur that radiates to the left axilla is heard. The physician suspects a genetic disorder resulting in a defective glycoprotein. What is the function of the glycoprotein most likely described above? Okay, from the question stem, hopefully you notice that this patient is tall with long extremities and has a cardiac murmur. The defective glycoprotein that's being described is fibrillin 1. These findings are consistent with Marfan syndrome. From the figure, notice that fibrillin 1 is a component of the microfibrils, which acts as a scaffold for elastin. So in answer to the question, the function of fibrillin 1 is to act as a scaffold for elastin.